I have been uh, mm, measuring uh, on the percentage of Peruvians that one qualify, qualify as core Fujimoristas or linear Fujimoristas or anti-Fujimoristas. I have data of the last 10 years. And as you can see, the core Fujimoristas have been around 9% in different points of, of time. But the anti-Fujimoristas have increased a lot, especially after the political crisis. So the relevance of negative partisanship, like Fujimori, has been fake of Fujimori, she, she was able to maintain a solid core. But Fuerza Popular has lost sympathizers as a consequence of this political crisis. Anti-Fujimorismo nowadays in Peru is the uh, largest, the most important negative partisanship in the country, which was around 50% during the election campaign. So considering the winners and losers of appeals, and also considering that this negative partisanship, it was kind of uh, obvious that what, uh, what was the candidate, we had more chances to, uh, uh, to conquer the hearts and minds of the Peruvians, especially during, during these, these uh, months. But let's talk about a little bit about Pedro Castillo. And I'm going to introduce the, um, uh, the a, a, a ideational approach of populism in order to understand uh, the success of, of Pedro Castillo. Uh, Pedro Castillo, uh, he holds kind of a thin I I I I ideology. Uh, in this case, populism understood as a, a thin ideology, which refers to the specific political method or style, one which claims to represent the true people against the ruling elite. So Pedro Castillo is the perfect populist leader considering his background. A ruler, a school teacher, a rondero, a junior leader from Cajamarca, uh, a poor region in, in, in Peru, that represents kind of a fairy tale. He was elected president 200 years after independence from the Spanish kingdom. And his political capital was made of social protests. He has raised as a, a, poly, as a populist leader with a plebiscitarian style a Manichaean uh, moral division of society into two homogeneous groups. This is the way I, I understand populism uh, following the literature on um, uh, ideational ap 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 approach with these two characteristics. Manichaean um, moral division of society into two homogeneous groups, the pure people versus the corrupted elite, and the politics as a popular, uh, popular so so sovereignty. Okay, these are the main characteristics of the Pedro Castillo's uh, supply side of populism that we can see here. I have here some quotes from, Dina, from his inauguration as a speech that can explain, can be some examples about this Manchian division, about this the dimension of popular sovereignty, and also the activation of a colonial anti-establishment discourse. Regarding the first one, for example, he said, I want you to know that the pride and pain of deep Peru ran through my veins, that I am the son of this country founded on the sweat of ancestors, built on the lack of opportunities for my parents, and that despite that, I also saw them re resist. Kind of, there are also another example of popular sovereignty. This time, a government of the people has come to govern with the people and for the people, to build from the bottom up, for example. And also this, uh, the discourse of the colonial anti-establishment, for example, the defeat of the Inca Empire began the colonial era. It was then, uh, with the founding of the Viceroy of Royalty, that the castes and differences that exist to this day were established. The repression of the just revolt of Tupac Amaro finished consolidating the Russian being imposed by the by royalty. It ended up uh, and the elites and subordinated even more to the majority of the indigenous inhabitants of this rich country. This speech was made, uh, 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 it was in a Congress in a formal setting when he performed this speech, so imagine Pedro Castillo in the plaza some in the streets uh, with, a, uh, with a more emphasis on this populist uh, dimension. But in the, the, the reason of Pedro Castillo is not only due to this thick uh, populist ideology, thin populist ideology, but also with the thick ideology. 
And Peru Libre, this political party, this political organization, holds, is the vehicle that holds this thick ideology. By thick ideology, uh, 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 I think that I'll focus on the substantial ideological elements, for example, authoritarian or nationalist worldviews. So examples of thick ideologies are so socialism, for example. And um, this uh, politician, Vladimir Serran, he's the responsible of the thick ideology of this um, political project. Vladimir Serran, he was trained in, in, in Cuba. He studied medicine in Cuba during the Periodo Special. This decay in the 90s of the, of the last uh, century, when it was first time for the Cubans. He was, a, he was trained during the hegemony of Fidel Castro down there. And if you uh, take a look or you read the documents of Peru Libre, you can find uh, Marxismo, Leninismo, Maya Tegis. The kind of a 20th century socialism based of, on class struggle, on the activation of the regional cleavage, Lima against province, versus provincias, and the politicization of race. This division between criollos and Andinos. So uh, here I have also some examples about this discourse. This is the Vladimir Serron's speech at Peru Libre's National Congress four days before inauguration. Day. It's kind of a, uh, uh, it, it, they're very emblematic about these dimensions. For example, this situation, the pandemic made the people see, like any crisis, the real structure of our society, the contradiction between them, the irreconcilable low antagonism, in short, they experience the class struggle in their own flesh, a struggle waged by the humanity since its e existence. Part of his speech also can be labeled as the activation of the regional cleavage. For example, it is the first time that a party forged in the Peruvian Andes has managed to prevail over the parties of the capital's aristocracy, demonstrating that in the globalized world, capitals are no longer necessarily the gravitational center of politics as they used to be. And also we can find some quotes regarding the politicization of race of this social division in Peru. For example, he said that the Vegido cabinet, Vegido is the prime minister, the Vegido cabinet in Congress will be the collision of two worlds the Criollos and the and, 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 and the. There was another uh, party event last week, and, uh, and, and, and the, 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 the main um, claims of the people uh, at attending this uh, political meeting last weekend was Pueblo si Lima no. This was like a kind of uh, uh, Manichaean division, but not only the that when they, they mix not only the, the class struggle, but also with this regional and this uh, uh, regional cleavage as, as, as well. Okay, but this is the supply side, right? I mean, this is a discourse and the speech of these two uh, leaders. But also, I have some evidence about how this uh, thick and thin ideology works at the demands based on uh, also in. Um, uh, in data from national service. Now I am comparing data from 2019-2021. In this case, uh, this is a left-right ideological self-conception scale from 1 to, to, to 10. And I am considering three groups. I am considering anti-Fujimoristas, core Fujimoristas, and leading Fujimoristas. Uh, Focus on this the, on, on the main polar, polarized groups that anti fujimoristas and core Fujimoristas. As and, and you can see the anti fujimoristas they belong to the left wing camp of the Ayatollah continuum, and the core Fujimoristas belong to the right wing camp. Uh, the anti fujimoristas in the last election, it was one month before the first round, uh, were uh, positioned in the middle of this scale. But the core Fujimoristas stayed in the right wing camp. So that the that, 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 that thick ideology kind of works in order to position these two polarized groups. But if we combine not only the thick ideological uh, dimension, considering this, this ideological continuum as a proxy, but also we want to combine this with uh, the thin ideological continuum. 
And in, the, in order to, to, to tackle the, the, the thing of ideological dimension, I conducted, uh, I, reply, I applied a um, populist index, a, 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 a group of seven, eight questions in order to position people in the in index from one to five, when one is, a, one is the lowest level of populist appeals and five is the highest level of populist appeals. And as you can see, anti fujimoristas they, they are uh, they score higher in this populist index, and core fujimoristas tend to score lower in this populist index. Uh, that I uh, reply from from other authors that conduct a similar research in, in, in other countries. So what is new? Several studies uh, portray the first phase of fujimorismo as a neo populist or as populist movement. But in the study of the demand side of populism, we have learned that there are connections between the populist appeals and the anti-establishment identifications. People that score higher in the populist index tend to develop anti-establishment political identities, and Pedro Castillo appealed to this group. Because, anti because being anti-Fujimorista is also a way to be anti-establishment, and connect not only with the negative partisanship of Fujimorismo, but also connect to the peoples that perceive themselves as the losers of the economic development of the last 30 years. So, as a consequence of, <laughs> of, of, of this process, they are in government now. And this is the left-wing coalition in, in power. I, 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 I try to, uh, to put all of the main political organizations and actors that belong to this left-wing coalition in, in power. The, 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 the biggest uh, uh, circle belong to Peru Libre, uh, uh, which is the organization that, uh, that performed most of the political work during the, during the electoral campaign. Pedro Castillo is, not, uh, is, is, is here, and you have other organizations, for example, in Nuevo Peru, uh, the candidate of Nuevo Peru was Veronica Mendoza. You have other smaller uh, political leftist political parties, like, for example, Frente Amplio, Juntos por el Perú, another group of r r radicals. You have uh, the vice president, Dina Boluarte, leftist technocrats. But which is really interesting here is that unions are also, they also belong to this coalition. It's a coalition not only of leftist organization, in which obviously Peru Libre is the is, is strongest, but also uh, unions, uh, for example, uh, school teacher unions, uh, uh, agrarian or organization, and, and this kind of um, uh, civil society groups. But as you can imagine, they are not as strong as they used to be. We are talking about unions in an informal society, in an informal economy, like in the case of Offer. But this is the coalition that now is in, is in power, and um, most of the ministers uh, come from these different, different groups. So, uh, final remarks about the, the, the prospects of um, Pedro Castillo. Uh, I can say so far that uh, we have a government which is a combination of uh, materialism and ra ra radicalism. Okay, and they have a popular support, a popular support which is strong actually in the Andean South. Uh, he's experiencing now a uh, honeymoon, but actually the honeymoon is not in Lima. In Lima, only 25% to 30% of the population are in favor of Pedro Castillo. But Castillo's honeymoon is in the interior of the country, especially in the, in the South. So what can we expect from this? Uh, policies and measures of a leftist and anti-establishment government from renegotiation of contracts. He, uh, they, are, they are willing to renegotiate contracts with gas uh, business groups, and obviously a constitutional assembly. <coughs> are they communists in power? Some of them. Some of them are communists, some of them were formed or were so, so socialized in radical political subnational organizations. There are some ministers, some legislators, advisors, particularly that come from uh, as, as small groups, but Peruvian civil society is not organized as Bolivia's. I want to mention Bolivia because I think that Castillo so far can, can be understood as an 
express version of, of Evo, Evo Bobodax. Okay, I mean, like union leader, anti establishment with a populist, this, this discourse that, uh, that in three, four years uh, 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 has converted in a uh, competitive family. But Peru Libre is not mass. Okay, Peru Libre is not that political party organized with its connections with socially rooted uh, uh, civil society unions, for example. However, even though the Castillo is a stress version of the Morales and Peru Libre is not mass, however, Bolivia is their own model. They are, they are trying to replicate the Bolivian experience and the Bolivian style in the, in the, the, the first, at least the first 60 days of, of this book. <coughs> Thank you so much for the time, and I will need to hear your reactions, your comments, or some questions about this. Thank you. Fujimorismo, there are internal divisions as well. 
some like people and some do not. And how does that account for this core winners or anti -genuity? Um, secondly, um, I would like to know something about um, similarities and differences with uh, classical populism in Peru. For example, we got Aguilera de la Torre and Abra. Does, it, um, does Peru Libre and Pedro Castillo have anything in common with that um, movement back then in the early 20th century? And my last question concerns the future of democracy in Peru. Uh, with this um, Pedro, Cast uh, Pedro Castillo in power, uh, in your opinion, what what could be implications from this, and how democracy in Peru would be like in the future? Okay, great, great, great questions. Uh, first, uh, yeah, I mean, Fujimorismo has gone through different phases. I mean, the, the, the classic Fujimorismo was from the 90s until 2006, 2006 when uh, Alberto Fujimori was the undisputed leader of this movement. And in the last 10 years, from 2011, uh, 6 to 2017, Keiko Fujimori uh, was uh, the political rival of her father. And Fujimorismo was divided between Albertistas and Keikistas. As a division within the political organization. And Kiko Fujimori built a, her own political organization. Corsa Popular is the first and formal Fujimorista party. Alberto Fujimori didn't need political organization, political party. He was more like a plaza leader. But Kiko Fujimori wanted to institutionalize Fujimorism. So, in order to do that, she built her own organization and she took some distance from the authoritarian leader of Alberto Fujimori, which was Alberto Fujimori, coincidentally, her father. But uh, she couldn't manage uh, the coalitions within the right-wing camp. Okay, I mean, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, uh, he, his political organization, Peronos for el Cambio, and Fujimorismo, they, uh, they are two sides of the same coin. They were two sides of the, of the same coin. But even though they both organizations belong to the politic to the same political camp, they could put together a coalition in order. Actually, I have another I have here a slide when you can see the fragmentation of the right, which is really there here please. These are the Fujimoristas and Peronos for el Cambio in 2011 and 2016 election. There were two, two types of the right wing camp that dominated. They got until 60% of the vote. However, they couldn't work together as government and opposition. The consequence was this fragmentation. This is the right wing camp right, right now, for example. But you can see that Eko Fujimori managed to maintain the most important share of the right wing. How? Without reconciling with her father. Okay, so now we have a unified Fujimorista. But the unified Fujimoristas are only, they only are the 13% of the Peruvian elect. This is how uh, Pedro Fujimori uh, tactic uh, worked in order to qualify to the, to the second one. It, it was close, I mean, Rafael Lopez Aliaga, a uh, right wing conservative was what was close to beat Pedro Fujimori, but she was able, she managed to reunify Fujimoristas. Consider that, uh, considering the, the previous bars, there is a lot of difference as you can see. That one is regarding your, your first question. Regarding your second question, I can say that we have had like different anti establishment political projects in Peru. And probably APRA was the first anti-establishment party in the in the in in Peru. Okay, there are all political organizations that try to express and to represent and to challenge the es establishment. First was APRA, the Izquierda Unida in, in the eighties, but also Fujimorismo. Fujimorismo was an anti-establishment political organization. Was a populist leader, was a neo-populist leader, a leader that performed neoliberal reforms 
based on the populist style. However, after first and Fujimorism second, they transformed from anti-establishment to pro-establishment forces. Keiko Fujimori, when she tried to institutionalize Fujimorism, actually she was moving Fujimorism from the anti-establishment camp to the pro-establishment camp. So what happened well, is that the anti-establishment camp, there was nobody, no political organization, no political leader trying to appeal to the anti-establishment camp con con convincing. Okay, because I mean, some of these leaders tried to do that. I mean, Cesar Acuña with the, with the speech uh, tackling the in informal sector, George Forsyth, he invented this term mis mismocracia, the, the, the ruling of the same people. I mean, <laughs> there were a lot of a a attempts in order to tackle the anti-establishment. And as, as you can see, anti-establishment can be left or right. -wing. And it was Pedro Castillo, the one that was able to, uh, uh, to create appeals in order to get the, uh, uh, the support of the anti-establishment class. You see what? You see I, I, I identity politics. I mean, the fact that he is a junior leader, a school teacher from a rural area, was con convinced most of Peruvians to vote for Pedro Castillo despite the radical groups, the lefty radical groups that belong to, to this coalition. And the future of Peruvian democracy, I think, is uncertain, um, unfortunately, because of the highly polarization. Well, uh, for the, the increase of polarization in the last years. I mean, I, I, haven't, I, mean, I haven't seen a, 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 another country with the evolution of society into these polarization settings. I mean, the fact that there are Peruvians that consider themselves that they, that they, that they uh, qualify as one and they qualify as ten. I, say, I mean, when they answer this sort of question, they say, I consider myself as one which is extreme left. And there are a lot of group of Peruvians, it's around 16% of Peruvians, that they say, I consider myself as an extreme right wing. I mean, there are a bunch of Peruvians that they are uh, recognizing themselves as part of the extremes of the Peruvian society. So uh, uh, I don't, uh, for me, this polarization is that now, nowadays, is the main challenge for the, for the Peruvian people. <laughs> With Pedro Castillo's calls for a new constitution being one of his core tenets in his campaign, and with, as you described, Pedro Libre's lack of connection to civil society like that seen in Bolivia, can we expect a successful campaign by Castillo and Pedro Libre to remake the constitution? Do you believe the Peruvian people would really support the creation of a new constitution, considering they only barely elected Pedro Castillo? That's a good question. I mean, people, not only Peruvians, but people want change. The idea of change, the message of, of change is really powerful. I mean, if you have two candidates, and one is a defender of the status quo, and the other one is a defender of, of, of they propose change, people will vote for the one that proposes change. And Pedro Castillo, uh, has been really successful to link the idea of change with the idea of a new const constitution. Uh, it's not going to be easy because there are a lot of constitutional in interpretations about if there is actually a formal way to do that, a formal way to reform, not to reform, but to, uh, to have a new cons cons constitution. And this is why Peru Libre has started the collection of signatures in order to, uh, to, to get 2.5 million, 2 million of signatures of people that are in favor of this uh, constitutional change. I mean, they have converted the idea of change in, uh, uh, in a way of doing politics, and in a way of doing politics in non electoral times. There are now in the streets and in squares and, and, and in plazas uh, mobilizing people. So he, uh, Pedro Castillo, and his uh, 
uh, political allies. Uh, despite that there is some formal considerations to take into account, they are willing to, they, they know that the, the, the way the path of the constitutional change is not only a, 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 a way to gain, to, to, to gain power, but it's also a way to appeal most of the rulings that were changed. And as you can see there in the graphics, they uh, now they feel that they are the winners of the election. Question about um, the relationship of Castillo and his movement with uh, the shadows, Chinatas, or the Sendero, and also the people who identify in the electorate as a skin left. What is their attitude towards uh, violence and kind of the Sendero past? This is a, a, a difficult question, actually, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, radicalism. Uh, is alive in the interior of the country. I mean, the country is, mm, some cities, some towns of the country, they have remained in the 20th century. I mean, in terms of economic development and also in terms of some I I ideas and some I I ideologies that are legitimate for them. Shining path now is um, the neutralization formally have disappeared. But there are some people, there are some groups of radicals, a small group of radicals, people that are linked to union leaders, because especially uh, school teacher leaders. Shining path was really strong in the union, uh, in the school teacher unions. So there's uh, some tradition of and of leaders, of members of these organizations that are linked to the, uh, to the legacy of Shemimba. And um, Anna Shemimba was the main political socialization group in some areas of the country. We also need to, to consider that in a country without political parties, in a country with, uh, with really weak political organizations, Shemimba was really strong in some communities, like for example in Ayacucho, in Aguilina, in some areas of this country. So, among, uh, among these areas, there are some people that have some relatives, some friends, that have links with this whole organization. So they are not, they, they don't consider Shemimba as enemies. They are familiar with these links. And, Pedro Castillo, uh, the, the groups, this coalition, these groups that belong to the coalition of Pedro Castillo, they have some connection, some radical connections with this legacy, with this legacy of Shemipa. They have abandoned the violence speech. However, they are not that drastic with, uh, with the legacy of these terrorists or, or organization. Please. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, yes, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, my original question was actually uh, related to some of what you had uh, said with, about uh, Keiko and Al Alberto, because as you know, we, we said, <coughs> Alberto was known as that populist figure, and I was completely on board with Pedro Castillo and you know, prospect theory, populism, because it echoes since of Trump's 2016 election. But I was, I was shocked by that the uh, Fujimoristas were or Fujimori is most, sorry, my face is not good, but and whatever, both, um, that they were in the anti-populist camp, and that was a puzzle for me, but because Keiko separated herself from her father, who, as you said, moved to the establishment thing, what made me uh, then think, I wonder if this research you're doing, if there could be a, another avenue to this, maybe a spin-off. One part you have the you know, prospect theory, populism, and Victor Castillo, but also the story of uh, the Fujimori, because that pattern that differs from, say, what happened with Peron or with um, the Republic of Korea in 2012, in December, the presidential election, uh, Bakken Hay won basically as a proxy vote for her father, a former dictator. Uh, there were people around some pictures of her father, who's basically like wink wink for the past 30 some odd years since she's been in politics. A vote for her is a vote for her father, so to speak. But this Keiko model is, I think, is, is interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that, where you use some of the nepotism, you use some of the resources from family, but then you create your own piece that's separated. And I'm wondering, like, you know, how Latin America is going to develop. Are we going 
can see more of it. Chile had an election with a former, was it, um, like military general in the uh, um, in the Pinochet regime was was running for president. And I don't know much about that, but I'm wondering, you know, do are we seeing more of the Peron model, where it's like, oh, you vote for Peron's widow, so vote for basically Peronism, or is it going to be more like Keiko, where even though it's the same name, it's a different beast now. I'm wondering if there's a comparative possibility of research there. I think it's a, it, yeah, I mean, that piece of Fujimori is more, uh, uh, under Keiko Fujimori is pretty difficult. Uh, I mean, she has gone through a different path. She has gone through a path of, when she tried to, to institutionalize a political organization, and when she tried to, uh, uh, to become a democratic actor, because Alberto Fujimori was anti-partisan. He was an anti-partisan leader. So Keiko Fujimori, when she tried to build a political organization, to build a political party, she also tried to have a democratic discourse, a democratic narrative. And the only way to do that was trying to take distance from their party. But she didn't have success in that. Okay, so <laughs> she didn't have success in this democratization path. So that's why as the last, her last attempt to recover some space among the electorate, she came back in a, to an alliance with her father. Okay? And it means that also she needed to, to be hard with her discourse in terms of democracy, or especially in terms of uh, the transparency of the election. I mean, she was really hard against the allegations of fraud during, during this election. Mm. And, um, surprisingly, Mario Vargas Llosa, a historic anti fujimorista leader, now had an alliance with her. It was actually, actually very surprising because it was kind of um, a reconciliation not only uh, among Fujimoristas, but also a reconciliation among the right wing, mm. okay? especially with, with Vargas Llosa. So, this is why I, I, I cannot say that there is, I, I, I cannot envision what will be the future, what will be the model of Fujimoristas. Because for one side, they try to democratize by the fair, they try to take some distance from the father and the fair, and now they are in this great song when we don't know if they can take the path of being just the legacy of Alberto Fujimori, being an organization, that capitalized the legacy of Al Alberto Fujimori, or if Keiko Fujimori wants an independent way. So I think that the Fujimori, and because also, if, if, if you can see the re results, it's not that Fujimori is that is strong. I mean, they, are only, they have only 13, 14% of, of the electorate. So I mean, it, it makes more difficult. To, to have some idea about the future of Fujimori, but in the in a in a, a fertile soil for political parties, this 13 percent is out. But uh, 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 unfortunately, I cannot say which one of, of these parts she will take. Oh, I'm not uh, trying to predict the future. I was thinking also too about other countries. Yeah, yeah. Here yeah. with Chile, Argentina. Yeah, I know. I mean. In, I mean, Correismo also failed to do that. They have, they have also the, 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 the I mean, Correismo also uh, split in different groups. In the case of Argentina, yeah, you have Peronismo for the right wing and left wing Peronismo. Uh, probably, probably a, a, a model uh, uh, or, a, or a project very similar to Peronismo is Udinese. Mm -hmm. Probably I think that they are similar political problems, a way that they try to uh, democratize with a strong leader uh, as the head of the organization. But uh, probably Uribe and Fujimori are the most similar cases to consider in South America. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Carlos, uh, I want to ask two very quick questions. First one is, as you know, in Latin America, uh, economic elites tends to, to like, uh, play a role uh, behind the election. Could you uh, say, could you see some intervening cooperation of the role of the economic elites during the campaign? Uh, what was your impression in, in that part in order to understand the rise of Castillo, and the 
second question is, uh, do you think if we need like a one reform of elections or electoral system in order to like uh, to avoid the polarization? How can they like uh, maybe avoid the, the polarization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean that's. This is the the Balotage, the last Balotage in Peru was I think one one of the last battles of this time. I mean the political elites, the political the political economic es establishment in, in, in Peru made a lot of efforts to maintain uh, their uh, status. And different. But they are still working on that. I mean, I think that the main opposition in Peru nowadays is not a political party, it's not a political organization, are the economic el 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 elites. Because most of, I mean, uh, uh, there's no more anti radicalism and anti establishment forces that changes the rules that explain the electoral, the, the current uh, economic establishment. I mean, the constitution of 1993 for the economic es es establishment is the main cause, the main reason, the main pillar of the economic status that they have, that they have gained so far. So they will be defending the status quo, they will be defending the, um, um, for example, if, we, if they are going to a, a play site in order to change the constitution, they will invest a lot of resources in order to keep the current constitution. So, uh, unfortunately for their interest, they don't have a solid political or organization. There is no political. Keiko Fujimori has the demonstrated her limitations. And so, they are looking for it. They know that Rafael López Aliaga is too extremist. They know that Hernando de Soto is obviously also has not connected with the uh, popular sectors and they have no no chance. They have resources, they have money, but they don't have pol politicians that can represent and can defend their uh, uh, interests. I will see. Next year we have subnational elections in in Peru. And probably we will have a plebiscite on the constitutional assembly if Peru Libre has collected the millions of, of signatures that they need. So we will, have, we will see another battle of this, the establishment trying to defend their status. Regarding electoral re re reforms, uh, we have had electoral reforms in, in Peru in the last 10 years, 20 years. We have electoral reforms every, every four or five years. And unfortunately, they haven't been su successful. Why? Because we still think that political parties are well-structured organizations. And we still think that people uh, are involved in politics based on positive partisanship. We need some political reforms that can handle the negative partisanship model, for example. We need political reforms for the informal sector. 75%, 72% of the labor force belong to the informal sector. There are people that do not belong to uh, or intermediate organizations. There are people that don't belong to unions or don't belong to other kinds of uh, uh, associations. People that don't have time for doing politics. So the only way that they are connected to politics are through elections or through plebiscitarian mechanisms. We need probably more plebiscitarian mechanisms, but not to undermine the legitimacy of representative democracy. We need plebiscitarian and direct democracy mechanisms in order to reinforce the representative democracy. And, uh, and we haven't uh, made changes in the electoral norms, in the political norms, regarding how to incorporate direct democracy institutions in favor of representative de de democracy. We have employed and we have used plebiscitarian or plebiscitarian mechanisms in order to contest, in order to undermine representative de de democracy. And we need to combine the merits of these two models and not to undermine each other. Awesome, thank you very much, really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions. I wanted to ask if you think that Castillo's lack of 
leadership and governance, although his ties to Malare, would be enough to impeach him, or that the people that have voted for him in this past election even care? And then secondly, I wanted to ask, if would you argue that his victory can best be attributed to what he represents, being from Provincia, a low socioeconomic background, being ended in descent, or would you say that his victory is more a product of Antifutumorismo, and that Keiko was probably one of the only candidates when that was, if she was placed against him, would prove his victory? Yeah, I mean, Pedro Castillo is a, 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 a multi-era politician. He has an experience, and unfortunately for his interests, the, the government so far is being a weak government. They, there's, there are no leftist technocrats that can collaborate with, with this government. So uh, amateurism has had an um, impact on the administration, on the efficiency of the public administration. And probably, that's why uh, a group, a, a, a relevant group of Peruvians do not approve that the, the government, do not support that the government. However, Pedro Castillo and his coalition, they are employing identity politics. This is the way they want to connect. And they, want, they, they, they calculate two tactics, two strategies to gain support or to maintain support from the electorate. Well, is that identity point. Not only this hat that is using every day, he wears every day, but also the use in Quechua in public speech. Also, the fact that they are, for example, the Prime Minister went to Congress and he chewed coca leaves in the, in, 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 in the main uh, room of the Congress in order to make some, uh, uh, some subsistence symbolic uh, messages to the Indian region. So they are, all, they are, look, they are using this uh, symbols in order to get the support of the electorate, of the Indian electorate. But also, they are now, they are trying to uh, capitalize historic uh, demands of the in interior. Demands that are linked to gas enterprises, demands that are linked with uh, former uh, public uh, business firms. So uh, there are a lot. There, there are politics. I mean, in Peru, we have been so used to technocratic politicians that now we have can now in, in, in power politicians to I mean, politicians employing symbolism in order to talk or in order to connect with people. They don't want to connect only at the level of efficiency of the public administration. They want to connect with these symbolic uh, roots, the symbolic or, or religion. So I, I, I think that's the way they want to survive. And, and that's, that's the way they are dealing with their political amateurism. And they got Thank you so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so the comparison you make with Bolivia is very interesting to me. Um, kind of on that idea, how do you see Castillo engaging with um, indigenous people, um, specifically in the Amazon, and maybe on um, issues like land rights? That's a great question because uh, actually this was part of a conversation I had with some uh, political advisors of the foreign government. Now they say that they have probably the messages, they have the language to connect with the Andean South. But they are not sure if they can connect with the people from the rainforest, for example. People from the Selva, people from the Amazon re re regions. So this is why that you can connect with some part of the indigenous population, which are the Petros, for example, but they might have difficulties in order to connect with other native groups in the same country. And this is important because it can delegitimize their, their intention to, uh, to keep this dichotomy, this Manichaean division. Because I mean, they want to represent the people, but they are not, they are not sure if they can represent all the anti-establishment people. I mean, they are they are doing okay with the Andean South, but they are not doing that good 
with other regions of the country where there are also mar historic marginalized groups. So this is a challenge for, for, for them. And this is why they have a lot of help from Evo Morales. I mean, Evo Morales in the last two months, he visited Peru three, three times. And, and after each of his uh, <laughs> visits to, 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 to Peru, you can see the influence of Evo Morales in current Peruvian politics. For example, now, uh, Pedro Castillo, are the, he uh, is, speaks on the National Constitutional Assembly. He didn't have, he didn't have that discord before. So the plurinational uh, 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 second name uh, now is there, and it wasn't uh, uh, two months ago. For example, the, the fight that nowadays they have with uh, gas enterprises, it is new for them. That, yeah, and it, it comes after a meeting where Evo Morales uh, was the, the main uh, is, is spokesman. So Evo Morales and Bolivia, they are playing a role model, an active role, role model for, for them. And probably they, they can advise uh, Pedro, Pedro Castillo how to deal with these fragmented indigenous or, or organizations in Peru. Perhaps the best ally of Castillo in terms of creating identity politics are the traditional elite from Lima. I mean, the racism that was coming from traditional politicians from the media was absurd. I mean, was, was really bland. So, I mean, so he's politicizing indigeneity in Peru. Yeah. But at the same time, that has led to all of this backlash of the white Limeño uh, elite. And you have a very good there, <laughs> also, which is probably the emblematic example of a uh, uh, limeño and its topics, right? Yeah, I mean, if you want to politicize race, it's, it not only depends on one side, it depends on both on, on sides, on sides. Um, we have racism, a lot of classism, a lot of cleavage. This cleavage is an is historic cleavage. I mean, Pedro Castillo is taking advantage of something that has been there for a long time. And, uh, and that, yeah, the op opposition and the establishment, they are also uh, going into, they're making a lot of errors, a lot of mistakes. Uh, and they have contributed to this dichotomic division. There are some groups of the elites that they are more intelligent than the other elites. And they are trying to make a discourse of human, this discourse of we don't need this division between these two groups we need to, 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 get, to get all 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 Peruvians together. But nowadays, you have seen for that. Uh, I mean, I also have some graphics about this polarization in two regions, for example. And you can see how here, if this polarization reproduces also in this context. So oh, yeah, the thing that the, the, the elites are part of the, uh, they are um, e emphasizing this division between, in all, in, uh, obviously there is a group that don't want to, but in general the elites are part of this division. What is your sense of what Castillo himself properly believes? I ask because yeah. there's an interpretation as to him being maybe pragmatic because he softened this discourse and a number of things, saying that you know maybe they'll hold off with the constituent assembly and keeping Pedro Franke, um, and he tries to roll back a lot of the more uh, upsetting statements by people in his party, etc. On a good deal. Um, is it your sense that he really is pragmatic, or that maybe he's just trying to accommodate different sectors? He's scared that he'll lose support from several and from the He's a plebiscitarian leader. I and mean, he's a leader of assemblies. He's, I mean, people that know, know Pedro Castillo say that he is really good at uh, link with the public of, with, with opinion, the public opinion of small groups, of active small groups. He's really skillful at reading the mood of the people in strikes, in protests, 
in the streets. Uh, so I think that I, that's why I tend to classify Pedro Castillo as a populist because of his, of his characteristic. He may not be a left wing, but he is a person, first of all, he is a populist leader. Okay? But he's surrounded by a coalition of left wing groups, well left wing organizations and left wing parties. So, that, so he connects with the people that surround him, and the people around him, they belong to the left, they, they have in common this uh, socialist worldview of the country. So even though he is kind of pragmatic, he is kind of he has this connection with the people, the people that are listening to he, uh, he's listening to these people. He's listening, this is the, the and, he's, and he, uh, he's very comfortable with these audiences. So uh, I, I, I think that even though he can have some pra pragmatism, he is surrounded by the leftist uh, common sense. And this is why the government is going to, to this path. I cannot see, I mean, I, probably it's very, it's very likely that Pedro Castillo can go through the path of Oyentumala, for example, that is starting the left of Trump to, to a century. Uh, uh, this would not only be the case of Pedro Castillo. Do you think he personally, for example, will want a constituent assembly? Yeah, he wants. Yeah. He, he uh, well, I mean, for, for sure, I think that he's willing to do that. Because that's what, the, when, we, when, when, when he visits uh, the interior of the country, the, the main demands of the people with, uh, that are active in these act, act activities and organizations, they are demanding that. And they want to listen. To, he wants to listen. To Another question. Do you think it's very interesting that you place Castillo in the extreme left, but also conservative side in terms of the anti-liberal, and then uh, there is polarization in the left and the right, but uh, perhaps the successful people are both in the uh, socially. Uh, liberal side, so could you talk a little bit about, for instance, how the right and the extreme left could agree in, uh, let's say, the anti-gender, I guess, what they call ideología de género, or anti-LGBT uh, ideas uh, in the kind of Catholic extreme right and maybe the so left, Castillo. Left wing radicalism in the interior of Peru has been traditionally conservative. I mean, the left, the left wing, the more important left wing, the more active left wing groups in the interior of the country, they, they, they are conservative. And this is why, in some cases, Pedro Castillo's le legislative group have some agreements with the, 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 the right, with the right wing, with the extreme right. Wing. Okay, and they, they can, they can have some agreements and they can have some consensus in some policies because of that. And I think this is the latest, this is one of the latest, for example, of the Shining Path. The Shining Path was a totalitarian and conservative project. They were, and so the interior of the, 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 the left wing organizations in the interior, they are very con conservative. And, and this is how they can make some, some bridges to, 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 the, to the right, to the extreme right as well, to the extreme conservative as well. But, they are in power, and if you, if you have your in power, you have a lot of political re resources. So, Veronica Mendoza and the more moderate left-wing leaders, they are also collaborating to move Pedro Castillo, because this is the only chance that they, they had in order to get into office. So, they are pushing for more liberal politics, for example, the uh, Minister La Mujer, for example, this, this next next week, and uh, they are organizing a workshop for the president or for the ministers about gender studies, for example. Okay. <laughs> so they are working. They are making a lot of efforts in order to to gain more uh, space in this in, in, in this coalition. But that's why I refer to the current coalition of a social twenty century socialist. It's not the 21st century. This is not the, the left that won elections in, in, in Peru 
is not a Bolivarian or not uh, an example of Jeku Perez and Pachacuti in, in Ecuador, for example. It's more conservative. And unfortunately, for people that agree with liberal values, they are now in power and they have two resources to maintain and to keep their, their values. Um, so, Pedro Castillo came into power, obviously, with the support of the Southern Andean region and the support of um, El Pueblo Indígena. Mm -hmm. um, another leader just up north that came into power co-opting the indigenous community as well was Rafael Correa until he lost the support of the indigenous community due to his resource extraction policies that were heavily opposed by the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Peru has the same bank of natural resources, but to promote um, these leftist ideas that are supported by Peru, uh, by Peru Libre, do you know if Pedro Castillo or if the Peru Libre platform has at all said anything on resource extraction, and if that is perhaps an issue that could lose some support in the indigenous communities? I mean, in Ecuador, you could say that it was the indigenous communities that caused um, Andres Araúz to lose the elections in 2021. Not about risk. And they know, they know that you, you have, we have, I mean, the, 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 more, the most important mining conflicts in Peru are in this area. Are in uh, Altai, Cusco, Ayacucho, and also Puno and Arequipa, especially in the south, in the areas where he had a lot of electoral support. Um, and they know that these people are, they, are not going to be like core supporters of uh, of Peru Libre. I mean, they might. I mean, they are building the government. They are they are trying to build a more solid links with this social progressive because this is a, a, a case where actually we don't know if identity politics will be stronger or will be more important than the ideological considerations based on mining conflicts or extraction conflicts. To be honest, that I mean, we, we need to, to know what will happen in the next months and in, 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 in the next years. Because yeah, there is a lot of identity politics going on here, but also you have the risk that people that are against junior uh, mining companies and mining projects they can left to uh, they, they can left the government coalition. I mean. To be honest, we don't know. We would, yeah, but we will see if one of these two hypotheses will work in, in order to understand the support of Pedro Pedro Castillo. Could you speak about Antauro Humana and his relationship with the Rubio or Castillo? Are there any plans that actually pardon him? That something that yeah, I mean, uh, Pedro Castillo during campaign offered amnesty to um, Antalya Mala. Uh, Antalya Mala has recently uh, mentioned that, that he's waiting for the amnesty of the, the presidential amnesty. Antalya Mala is the leader of one of these radical groups. Uh, and some of the radical groups of Antalya Mala belong in some way to this to, to this coalition. Probably he will be um, an, uh, an important politician if he's not longer in jail. We, we will see. But uh, during electoral campaign, amnesty to um, Antalya Mala was one of the one of the campaign offers of of, of Pedro Castillo. So far, the government hasn't said anything expressly about that. But we'll see. And that matter, he, he already maintains some le leverage in, in these uh, radical groups. OK, thank you, Professor Rene, very much <laughs> for the very informative talk. Uh, let me invite you to a uh, to an event that we will have next week. It's Thursday at what time? Four? Thursday at 4 p.m. in the in room one channel, we're going to have a book launch on natural resource destruction and the, and, uh, and the attacks to uh, multiculturalism in Ecuador. So we're having Peru today, we'll have Ecuador.
next week. So thanks so much. Thank you, oh, thank you so much for the invitation.